webinar. So this is uh, a fourth webinar in the series, and then uh, for the month of July. So today we are hosting Professor Tony Bates, and uh, he will be talking on equity and online learning uh, practical steps. Then uh, Professor Tony Bates, I'll be reading uh, a few of uh, his citations uh, very soon. So Professor Tony Bates uh, is here with us. He'll be talking to us on the topic uh, which uh, I have mentioned earlier, equity and online learning. Okay. So um, just without wasting much of our time, I would quickly like to run through uh, the citation of Professor Tony Bates. Just a short one. No. I'll provide about three pages citation, and I'll be giving a URL for those who will be interested to read more about our uh, professor Tony Bates at the end of the webinar or using the chat uh, um, box. Professor Tony Bates is the president and CEO of Tony Bates Associates, a private company specializing in consultancy and training in the planning and management of e-learning and distance education. He is also distinguished visiting professor at the G. Raymond Chang School of Continuing Education, Ryerson University, Toronto, and a research associate of Contact North, Ontario. Professor Tony Bates Associates was started in 2013 and since as served over 50 institutional clients, including UNESCO's, the World Bank, uh, UK Open University, to mention a few. Professor Tony Bates has a PhD in Educational Administration from the University of London, England. He was awarded degree of Doctor Honoris Causa by the Open University in Portugal in 1995. Doctor of Letters, Honoris Causa from Laurentian University, Canada in 2001. Doctor Honoris Causa from Athabasca University in June 2004. Doctor of Social Sciences, Honoris Causa from the Open University of Hong Kong in December 2004. And Doctor Honoris Causa from the Open University of Catalonia, Spain in June 2005. His hobbies are skiing, flying a small plane, but now he mainly plays golf. He's married with two sons, three grandsons, and a granddaughter. Yeah, welcome on board, Prof. <laughs> so that's just like a summary of uh, uh, the biography of Professor Tony Bates. So please, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be having Prof now. So I want us to uh, make use of the chat box and also the question and answer feature from our control panel. So when, we, if you have any question, we can actually do that. And we also want everyone to put their mics on mute. Okay, so, and then now I'm handing over to Professor Tony Bates. Over to you, sir, your presentation now. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I'm sorry about the long introduction, but when you're very old, you get to do a lot of things. <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to switch over to um, the, my, my PowerPoint now. Um, I just want to check that everybody is able to see this. Yes, can you we see can that? See it, sir. Yes, we can see it, sir. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm, I, I feel a little awkward doing this presentation because I've never been to Nigeria. It's one of the countries, unfortunately, I've never been able to visit. And I really don't know what the context is like there. Uh, I did a little bit of research online before uh, this, this uh, presentation, but uh, all I can say is I'm talking from experience, mainly in uh, countries such as Canada and the UK and so on. So you please gonna have to see and, and let me know which bits really don't apply in Nigeria because the situation is so different. And I say that because context is so important in online learning. 
Um, what you can do in one context is often not possible to do in another context. So, uh, but that's true of all education, of course. Um, what you can do uh, in, in a university in, in Nigeria might be very different from what you can do in a university in China, for instance. So having said that, let me talk about equity and online learning and some practical steps. Uh, first of all, the, I've given you more or less the introduction. Then I want to talk about access and technology. Um, different technologies have different limits on what they can do in terms of access. I wanted to start with some limitations of online learning. I've worked as a, uh, an apostle of online learning, uh, an advocate for online learning all my life. But as a result of COVID-19, we are seeing some expectations of online learning that are just frankly unrealistic. And I think we need to talk about that. Um, but I also want to talk about the things it does really well uh, as well. And then I want to talk about how you can implement quality online programs, um, taking account of the equity issues and the accessibility issues, and then talk a little bit about what's going to happen next in online learning. Let me start with uh, the, the technology. And there are two basic technologies we use in online learning. So one is video and the other is text. Now video is being increasingly used. We're using Zoom now. This Zoom has become very popular with COVID-19, but it has some real limitations. You need a minimum of 10 megabits per second on the desktop for uh, streaming video. When I say on the desktop, that's not 10 megabits per second into the house or into the uh, uni university or college, it's to the desktop. So if you have a family of four people at home during COVID-19, one is working online, the teenager is playing video games, and the 14-year-old is, 13-year-old uh, is trying to get a lesson online, they're probably not going to get 10 megabit megabits per second down onto the desktop. Now, you can have two kinds of video, synchronous, live, like like this one video, uh, like Zoom, or asynchronous recorded, such as YouTube or Zoom recorded, which can be streamed. So video can be both synchronous and asynchronous. You can be live or you can access it whenever you want to. Now, if we look at low bandwidth technologies, that's between two to 10 megabit per second to the laptop. It, it has to be primarily audio or text-based to be reliable. It's not to say you can't get video, but it's often slow downloading. You get, it gets annoying to use. So then you're looking at either email or virtual learning environments or learning management systems, such as Moodle or desire to learn or podcasts, for instance. Um, and even they take quite a bit more bandwidth than say just straight text. And this is tends to be entirely asynchronous. So you've got those two technologies, which gives you some flexibility about how you decide to deliver online um, because you can reach more people with low bandwidth, um, audio or text-based. Then the other thing that people haven't really taken a lot of account of until COVID-19 is the cost of equipment, a cost of having a computer or a tablet or a modem or a, even a mobile phone. It's not just the equipment, it's the data costs as well. So if we take that into, my, into, in, 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 into mind, at the moment, and again, this is, I know, changing very, very rapidly. Nigeria has the fastest growth rate, I believe, in access to the internet of any country in the world at the moment. But nevertheless, at this moment, one third of homes in Nigeria will not have internet access. And some households in internet areas won't be able to afford the equipment or the data costs. So if you can look at something like nearly 40% will not have internet access sufficient for study purposes. They may have mobile phones, they may be able to uh, do messaging and so on, but you would really have to, if you wanted to run a, a full-time full course or program, that would be very, very difficult. 
Now, I know in Africa, there's been some really interesting developments, uh, innovations in the use of mobile learning for, for teaching and learning. But again, I'm, th I'm thinking here more of full-time education, and then it becomes difficult. As I said, it's rapidly changing, but I think they say the poor is always with us, but I think the poor will always struggle with uh, online learning because it's really a middle-class technology. You have to have a sufficient level of income to really benefit from it. And that will vary from country to country, it depends on how many people, what proportion of people are really poor and can't afford it. But given that situation, if we're thinking of online learning as a delivery method, we also have to think of alternative arrangements that will be uh, necessary for this sizable minority. And one, one obvious way is using local centers that do have internet access and equipment. I know in Nigeria, you have a lot of uh, educational centers often, uh, often run by voluntary organizations in, in the poorest areas. And uh, if you could build on that infrastructure, for instance, to allow access, that would help some of those people who can't afford internet access at home or don't have internet access at home. Even here in Canada, we've had to put in special arrangements. We have many people living in remote areas in Canada. It's a very big country with very few people in it. But we have particularly uh, indigenous uh, Aboriginal people living in remote areas who do not have good internet access. So we have an organization in Ontario called Contact North, which has built centers, um, or not built them, it's found a hut or uh, a house uh, in, in a small uh, Aboriginal reserve and got in some kind of satellite um, reception so they can have internet there. And they hire somebody from the community and train them as somebody who can help these people who've never used the internet before and give them access. So in these uh, remote centers, students can access any online course from any university or college in, in, in Ontario. So um, Contact North provides a list of all the courses that they can take online. Um, build on in existing infrastructure, such as internet cafes, if you have them in, in, in Nigeria but also look at alternatives uh, technologies to support the online learning, such as television and even radio, if that's possible. So in Bangladesh, they've been using television, radio and local newspapers um, to help with students who um, can't go to university, for instance. And then there's the accessibility issue, which is not to do with money, but it's to do with, um, physical circumstances. Uh, how do you make sure that students who are deaf or blind can benefit? Now, fortunately, there are a set of universal design for learning guidelines that really every online developer should be aware of and build into their online courses. They're very simple things like make sure that content is presented in more than one medium so that if people have uh, um, uh, reading problems, they there's an audio version of it. Um, and the technology now allows you to do that. You can get automated uh, audio tran uh, trans uh, transmission of text, for instance. Um, I, but it's not only those with physical difficulties, often students have learning difficulties as well. So these universal guidelines are very, universal design guide for learning guidelines are very useful. And if you just, don't, if you don't know what these are, you can just type in universal learning, uh, universal design for learning guidelines and, and you can find them on the web and they're free. And the other thing that really affects the equity is that online learning benefits some students much more than others. We know that older, more mature students benefit more, um, particularly students who are working or have families um, who find it very difficult to go full time to a campus. So the, these are the traditional online students. The, the, these are lifelong learners, I would call them. And then there are students who are independent learners. These are, these are students who will take responsibility for their own learning. 
Um, but not all learners are like that. Many, many younger students are not uh, independent learners. I have two, I have four grandchildren and I have two at the extreme ends of this. I have one 18 year old grandson uh, who prefers to get up around about midday, go to bed about four o'clock in the morning, um, but he's totally hopeless at organizing his life. And he's, he just cannot handle online learning. And he's been really struggling when the school put all their courses online this year. I have a 15 year old granddaughter who loves online learning. She likes to manage her own life. She can study whenever she wants. Uh, she, she doesn't have to fit in with other people's timetables and agendas. And she really likes um, online learning. So again, so it fits some learners, it doesn't fit others. But generally most 16 to 18 year olds should be able to manage online if it's well designed. And we'll come back to that later. For eight to 15 year olds, you can use it for specific purposes. It, it doesn't replace all the activities that eight to 15 years old need, but it can do some of them. It can help with developing their reading and writing skills, for instance. So there are specific things it can do well, uh, even for eight to 15 year olds. Below seven to eight year olds, my view is it's very difficult to replace the need for social learning outside the family. Uh, kids need at that age to be running around. I know that's very difficult with COVID-19, but it's really hard to replace the kind of learning that children do at that age with online learning because it's so experiential. It's so much based on what they do outside uh, of screens and so on. And too much screen time for those children is, is not good for them. They're already playing games online. Uh, if they have a lot of teaching online, it's really not very good for them. And also parental support is critical. The younger the child, the more parental support is needed. And again, that's often difficult because parents are out working or uh, have other children to look after. So again, you can't rely on parental support for online learning necessarily. But what it is good for, particularly using low bandwidth, like learning management systems, is for teaching content, content transmission, thinking skills development, things like critical thinking skills or uh, reading and writing skills in children, interesting project work, project work that appeals to the students. Uh, they can do that online. They can do that collaboratively online with other students. Uh, asynchronous communication, um, and online collaborative learning. So these are all good things that can be done online, even with children in the, say, the eight to eight, eight years and above. But we're finding it's difficult for most practical work, um, labs, equipment use and studio work. Although some activities, alternative activities can be designed to be done at home, but teachers need time to think about how to do the, what students can do at, uh, at home. Um, what we are seeing with online learning is growing use of simulations and games and other things that can reduce the amount of practical work, but not completely replace it. And as I said, it's difficult for social development in children. Uh, and the younger the children, the more difficult. So what do we know that works well? Well, we've had 30 years experience of online teaching. Um, we've identified many best practices through research. We know what works and what doesn't. Unfortunately, most teachers and administrators are unaware of this best online practice. Now I try to put this into my online, free online textbook called Teaching in a Digital Age. It's aimed at it was written originally for university and college instructors, but it's been used very heavily with school teachers as well, I'm finding. And I want to take a look at some of one chapter of this book, which is Nine Steps to Quality Online Teaching. Um, there are a, a lot of quality standards. I, I found 20 different sets of quality standards um, online online quality standards for online teaching uh, around the world. There, there, there's online standards for different sectors 
and in different countries, you probably got a set of quality standards in Nigeria. I couldn't, I didn't find it, but I, I didn't look very hard. These are based on experience and research of what works. They're all quite similar. They're mainly process focused. In other words, they like uh, tick boxes. Have you done this? Have you written clear learning objectives? Uh, do, you, do you have active learning built in, et cetera? Um, so you go down and look at whether your design meets these standards. It's a kind of post hoc evaluation of a, an initial design. They're all quite similar. They don't, they don't differ very much. And they're often unknown or ignored by instructors. Um, I have a slightly different approach in my book. Um, I, I, I have a sort of different definition of quality, which are teaching methods that successfully help learners develop the knowledge and skills they will require in the digital age. So quality standards for me are necessary, but not sufficient. We have to be increasingly innovative in our teaching. And to be innovative, you have to go outside best practices. You have to try something new. Now you can have best practices for innovation, such as evaluation. You have to evaluate your innovation to see if it's worked. But nevertheless, it means doing something different. And the book looks at ways in which you can innovate as well as best practice. But these nine steps are based on best practices and don't deal with the innovation side, except for the first one, rethink your teaching. We know now that just moving a classroom methodology online is not a good idea. Um, we've had students complain that they've had 40 hours of online Zoom lectures a week and it drives them absolutely crazy because they're sitting there listening passively for, for 40 hours. It doesn't work. Online teaching is different. It's a new learning environment. It's a new, if you think of us, the traditional learning environments, they have classrooms, they have buildings, they've been developed over a hundred years or so and they're based on an industrial model. Everybody goes to work at nine, they all go to college at nine. They go home at five or six or whatever, and so on. Everything's organized in little pockets of classes, every curriculum timetables and so on. When you go online, you're creating a different environment. You don't have to follow that bricks and mortar structure, for instance. It offers you new opportunities to create new learning environments. So the first question is, what are your core learning outcomes? Do they need to be the same as face-to-face -face, or could you actually create different ones? And I'll talk about that a little in a little bit more detail because as we move from an industrial to a digital age, so our learning outcomes should change to match that. And I want to talk in, about the increasing importance of skills development over content delivery. And lastly, do we need to assess students in the same way once we go online? The thing about online learning is that it leaves a trace, it leaves a track of what students do as they work through a course. So you don't have to wait till the end of a course to assess them. You can assess them as they're working their way through. You can see their progress as they go through a course. So could we think of assessment in a different way? And I, I say this because what we're seeing is a constant change in work. Uh, in Canada, within 10 years, 50% of all jobs will have disappeared and been replaced by new jobs. And the ones that stay will require new skills. So digital competency is gonna become essential for all jobs. And by that, I don't mean coders and programmers, but people who can work like this in a digital environment and got the skills of communication online and so on. And in particular, the jobs will be for people to bring human skills to bridge technology and humanity, not just call centers, but um, much wider than that. And this is a result of research done by banks in Canada, actually. They've identified some of these skills like good communication skills, ethics and responsibility. But I want to focus particularly on the bottom two, Information technology skills embedded in a subject area. This is knowing how to use 
in business, things like geographical inf information systems to track where activities are, say in the housing, real estate markets and so on. And knowledge management, knowing how to find information, how to evaluate its reliability, how to apply it to what you're, you're doing. These are gonna be increasingly important skills. And online learning has a special role in helping develop such skills. We know a lot about skills development. We know that, um, for instance, we can make a distinction between content and skills. Content are what I call facts, ideas, principles, and knowing. Skills is really about doing, understanding, analyzing, evaluating, applying. Now you need both. You can't be a good doctor without knowing microbiology, but it's not enough to know microbiology. You have to know how to apply that to solving medical problems, for instance. So both are necessary, but in our academic institutions, particularly content has been the traditional priority. We know a lot about how to teach skills. Um, for instance, we know it's relatively context specific. Teaching business online is not the same as teaching, uh, so, sorry, solving problems in business is not the same as solving problems in medicine. Not only is the content different, but the approach to problem solving is slightly different. Uh, in, in medicine, um, you're, they're risk averse, do no harm. In business, you have to take a certain amount of risk. So uh, risk plays a more important part in, in problem solving in business than it does in medicine. It take, takes a different role. Now, I'm not saying that a good businessman couldn't become a good medical doctor if they learned medicine, but nevertheless, um, it is relatively context specific. Learners need lots of practice. We know that. Now, online learning is a very good way of giving students opportunities to practice. Small steps initially, and very important, regular feedback from an expert. So the expertise of the professor is still important, but it's different. It's not presenting content to students. It's checking on the skills that students are trying to develop. And also skills are developed over a lifetime rather than one course. One of the things we don't talk about much is how do we improve a student's critical thinking from year one to year four in a particular subject area? How do we know that skill is getting better as they get, get do more courses, for instance? And now there's a special role for technology. Um, students need to learn digitally if they're gonna earn and live digitally. Um, we're living and working virtually, so we've got to build that into our teaching as well. And digital technology can provide lots of practice and feedback to some extent. And students need to know the strengths and limitations of digital technologies for work and life. So this has to become integrated within every subject area. The other thing that makes a huge difference when students go online is what I call the open education movement. I don't mean open universities here, but things like open textbooks. Every first year and second year course in my province, British Columbia, now has an open textbook. Students needn't buy a textbook. These are textbooks they can go and download online for free. Open research. Um, if you get a grant from government in Canada, you must publish in an open access journal. So all research is becoming open and free. So we're building a open educational resources like my textbook that anybody can download and use. Now, what this means is that content will be free, abundant and online. Basically, you'll be able to find anything you want by going online. So students don't need to come to universities to get content now. It's all out there. I'll tell you another story from another one of my grandsons. I went and saw him online. He's studying physics, first year physics in England. And I said, oh, has your professor put your course online? He said, no, my professor's a terrible lecturer. We got a rough idea of the content. What, we got a rough idea of the topics, but we can't follow what he's saying about them. So we make a note of the topics and then we go on to MIT Open Courseware and look at their lectures, which are much better than mine. So, Students will use, will go online to find stuff anyway. What will be the big differentiator 
is the learner support that you can give to students. So that's, to me, is the real game changer. Now, unfortunately, most of these open access resources are mainly available in English, in the English language. What we need is a lot more open resources in other languages as well. Um, but this is really changing the nature of higher education, particularly in, in, in Canada, is this increase in open, openly freely licensed uh, resources. So what we're seeing then is a shift from uh, lectures, information transmission, to knowledge management. Students going out and finding stuff and bringing it back and analyzing it and having it assessed by an instructor. A combination of skills development and content. We're beginning to see lecture-based courses being replaced by student projects, problem-based learning and collaborative learning. And we're seeing a change in assessment away from written exams um, replaced by e-portfolios where students collect their work through, throughout the course, organize it, present it for assessment to the instructor um, rather than having a written test at the end of the course. So what would an advanced digital learning course look like? Well, it would be based on a core skill called knowledge management, like such as knowledge management, how to find, analyze, evaluate, and apply information. Students would access open content, but within a learning design. You still have a learning management system. It would still structure what the students have to do. They bring their work back into the learning management system, but there's a design around that, but it's the students going out, finding the content and analyzing it. Student would de generate the content often in multimedia forms, podcasts or a little video, uh, YouTube uh, videos, assessment by e-portfolios. And that's just one example. The example here is from a graduate program in University of British Columbia. It's about how to set up a business using learning technologies. And the structure of this course is very interesting. There are basic things that the students need to know, marketing, how to do a business plan and so on. So that, that's still content that's in the course. But when the course opens, the students are told to research latest technology. What's the technology that's come through in the last 12 months? They go online and research that, and then they have to come up with a way of building a business around that particular technology. So the faculty don't know what the content's going to be. The students are identifying the content. Then they're asked to apply the marketing and business plan and so on. And they end up by doing a, a two minute um, elevator pitch for the business. They're told, imagine that you're in uh, an, a, an elevator, a lift with uh, somebody who's got a lot of money and is looking to fund something. How would you sell that in two minutes? And what's the video? They make a little video of that. So again, this is a different way of designing, using the technology, but looking at the development of 21st century skills. So that's step one, rethink the curriculum. Step two, what kind of course? Now, we, we, at one time, we had fully online courses and then quite separately face-to-face -face teaching. We're seeing that blending now. We're seeing that more and more as instructors go online with COVID-19, when this is over, they'll come back and say, well, there are things I could do better online than I'm doing in my face-to-face -face class. So we'll, we'll combine that. So we're seeing this sort of bl blurring of the distinction between fully online and face-to-face. -face. And in particular, I think we need to focus, you know, every, everybody's being critical of online learning. You can't do this online and so on. Uh, so the default position has been in the past that face-to-face -face is inherently superior, but we found time and time again that that just isn't so. It's the conditions that matter. You can do face-to-face -face teaching well, or you can do it badly. You can do online learning well, or you can do it badly. So I have a law of equal substitution. Everything can be taught as well online as face-to-face, -face, except, and it's the exceptions we should really focus on, and identifying clearly from research and experience what is less well done, such as practical work and so on. 
So my question is, why should students get on the bus? What are you providing on campus that they couldn't do online? And that's a much harder question because increasingly students will say, well, like, why are you giving them a lecture on campus? They could, you could do that just as well online. Um, so why come on campus? And I, I think we need to rethink the campus experience as a result of online learning. Now, I think there are two answers to that. One is it depends on the students. Some students are older, more experienced than they like fully online. Students who are working part time because they're trying to pay for their tuition fees, even though they're supposed to be full time students, like blended courses. And young students fresh from school, they much prefer to be on campus. But the other thing is the subject requirements. We know that theory, content and soft skills like um, critical thinking can be taught just as well online as face to face. But hands on and practical is more difficult. Although we're seeing that we can reduce that time on, on, on hands on through video simulations and games, but there's still a lack of quality resources here. We need a lot more resources in the way of simulations and games to be able to replace the hands on experience yet. And now I'm going to go through fairly quickly the, the other steps. Um, step three, work in a team. We know that online learning is difficult. Design of courses is critical. So instructors and uh, online specialists such as yourselves and librarians and technical people need to work together as a team in order to uh, get good quality online courses. We need to build on existing resources. Um, I, I frequently come across huge arguments about which is the best virtual learning environment. Is it Moodle? Is it um, Blackboard? Is it desire to learn, etc. That fact, I don't think it matters too much. Um, there's not a lot of difference between virtual learning environments. Um, the big difference between asynchronous and synchronous tools, such as web conferencing. And there we have to think about the affordances of each. There's a value in both. It's not either or, but when do we use synchronous and when do we use um, build on existing educational resources, build on what your colleagues have developed. Uh, I worked in a university and I had two courses on pharmaceutical sciences um, in the same department, in the same course, program, taught one, one taught by one professor and one taught by another. And a student said to me, is the diagram in Professor X's course, is that the same piece of equipment as this diagram in Professor Y's course. And so I got the two professors together and asked them this question. It's the first time they talked together. They, they had offices next to each other, but they didn't talk to one another. If they got together, they could have produced a much better diagram than each one of them doing it individually, for instance. So we, we don't share enough of what our colleagues do. And of course, that will save a lot of time for instructors as well. Instructors must master the technology. Um, to me, the learning management system is the essential core structure, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But, but faculty need to know what it can do. They often say to me, oh, I can't do this in uh, my learning management system. And then you find out they, they, they can, they just don't know. Um, but the training should be related to what the instructors want to know. Can I do this in, in, in my learning management system? Usually they can. Develop course templates so that they don't have to develop every course from scratch. And above all, don't get into LMS wars about which is the best one. That's a waste of time. If your university or IT departments adopted one, go with it. Set learning goals. I said step one. Are they new or different? Um, some online roles like developing 21st century skills, subject specific internet or IT skills, and also the ability to bring in the outside world um, through blogs or wikis and so on. We had a course on Latin American studies where they looked at the nationalization in Argentina of a Spanish oil company. And the students had an online discussion forum. And one of the students said, 
look, we're not asking anybody from Latin America about this. Why don't we create a wiki and put it out there and see what happens? So they put a wiki out there about what they've been discussing in the class. Within a week, they had professors from Argentina uh, giving completely different reasons for the um, uh, nationalization than the ones that came up in the course. So you can bring in the outside world into your teaching very easily by going online and communicate goals to students. Make sure the students understand the goals when you go online, that they might be different to what they've been used to, particularly if you're, if you're using, you're trying to develop 21st century skills and use the learning goals to drive assessment so that students can see whatever activity they do, how it links to how they're gonna be assessed during the course. And this to me is the most important one. We have to create a structure for students when they're working online. And that means determining the average weekly study time on, your, on a particular course, including online and campus activities, if it's a blended course, for all learners. And that should include all activities, including assessment. I, again, it depends how you structure your courses in Nigeria, but here we, I have a rule of thumb, which is for a, a one semester course, it's about eight hours study time a week. That's that because students are often doing more than they're doing five courses if they're full time. So eight hours study time and all the activities have to be built into that time. So you have to make some estimates about how long it's gonna take them to do the assessment, for instance, because that has to come out of that eight hours. Um, and what we find when you do that is that usually courses are overloaded with content and students don't have enough time to develop skills, for instance. So having that kind of limit in your head of how much time is very good for uh, designing your courses. Um, and again, you don't have to follow that kind of three lectures a week module. You can have a topic that extends over a whole week, for instance, or projects that extend over a month even. Um, learner activities are really important. Uh, read, research, discuss, do, and relate activities to the outcome and your assessment um, and make sure faculty control their own workload by breaking students into groups and assessing group work, um, but also allowing for individual students to be assessed as well. And lastly, communicate, communicate, communicate. It's really important for instructors to be present online every day. That doesn't mean to say responding to every student comment or every student question, but making sure students know that you're following what they're doing. Um, set clear expectations for learners, what they're supposed to do uh, and when they're supposed to ha hand stuff in and so on, and that they're expected to meet deadlines, etc. and what will happen if they don't. Uh, clear learning goals and activities and so on. Make students do the work. Um, avoid spending too much time presenting content. Get students to do the work finding content and above all monitor their learning activities. The great thing about online learning, I find, is that what I tend to do is to have a, a set of activities down one side of a spreadsheet and the names of the students along the top. And then as I go online and look at what they do, and I tick off in each box if this student has done this and so on. Now, actually, there are some tools in some learning management systems that will do that for you. But then I can see at a glance at the end of the week who's done what. And then I can send an email to a student saying, you haven't done any work this week, what's the problem? And lastly, innovate and evaluate. It's an exciting time to be an instructor. It's a chance to experiment and change for after COVID-19. We need to better prepare learners for the future. We need to make them digitally literate. And now is the time to try something new and see what works and what doesn't. So there are some basic design principles. Quality does matter, both online or face-to-face. -face. Students need a structure. Um, you need to work out if they're gonna do blended learning, what's the best way to use the online, uh, the face-to-face -face time as well as the online time. Students need regular activities done on time. We need to do both synchronous and asynchronous, face-to-face -face and online, but we need to be driv drive everything by learning outcomes and assessment. 
So what next? <clears throat> well, I think the new normal is that we need to teach digital skills for a digital world. Some blended learning in every course, uh, fully online for specific markets like the lifelong learning market. We need to get the right balance between classroom and online learning. We have a lot of experimentation to do in that area to get it right. And we need quality design to guide us. So I wish you all good luck working with your faculty, with your instructors. And I hope we have time for questions and discussion. Over to you. Oh, sure. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Tony Bates. But that was a very exciting presentation from you, sir. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we've got some a uh, couple of questions uh, from our participants here. And also, I want to employ all the participants to kindly make use of the chat box to ask that question. So, in the meantime, I'll take these first two. A question from me coming from Akiki. She's asking, okay, let me just read the question text. Customs die hard and school principals tend to be rigid and tied to the dictates of the curriculum. What are the possible strategies for bringing them to speed with the changing education landscape? That's a that very is the good question. question. Yes. Um, countries vary enormously in the freedom they give to their teachers um, to um, but e even in countries where teachers have a good deal of freedom, there tends to be a, a provincial or a national, a state or a national curriculum that's set down for what they have to do. Now, a good school system will lay down the learning outcomes, but leave the methods to get to those outcomes more flexible for the teachers to decide how to get to those learning outcomes. In other words, you know, you have to reach a certain level in mathematics or you have to reach a certain level in teaching, um, but you have some freedom to decide how to get there. Unfortunately, too many countries now have uh, what I would call a, a rigid curriculum that breaks down even these learning outcomes into specific activities that teachers must follow. And we see what happens when we go to COVID-19, that just doesn't work. You can't do that when you move out of the classroom environment. Uh, you have to give the teachers more freedom to decide what kind of activities students could do to reach those learning outcomes, ones they could do at home rather than in class, for instance. And that's particularly true in the practical areas like science teaching, for instance. Uh, you, you just can't come into class and do a lab experiment but you might be able to do something at home fairly safely, but you need the teacher to have the freedom to be able to work that out. Um, so how do you get school principals? Well, school principals are following the curriculum that they've been given. So this is a question really of opening a conversation between people like yourselves, I guess, um, and, and government ministries about how the world is changing and how we need to have a kind of different curriculum brought in that now the way I sell it, I, I, I say this is this is an, um, a labor market issue. If you want a thriving economy, then you have to develop these kinds of skills. If you, your graduates don't have these skills, they're not going to thrive in this kind of digital economy. That usually gets their attention. Um, but it, it needs um, it needs an upwards and downwards communication between government and the education profession here. And I, I'm not sure how you do that in Nigeria, but it's a very important ongoing essential conversation to have. And sensible countries will have established some kind of communication between say teachers unions, school administrators, uh, ministry officials and politicians. So there should be ongoing discussion about the curriculum and how that should change. Thank you so much, sir, for that piece. 
uh, it was uh, a very enlightening response. And then uh, I have some other questions there. Um, Mohammed Aruno asks that how practicable is the hands-on is the hands-on mind approach to teaching in science through learning? Yeah, um, there are a lot of challenges in teaching science online. I won't, don't want to gloss over those. Um, we are seeing more and more uh, simulations coming in. Um, you can simulate an experiment, for instance. Uh, it depends. What it means is breaking down what you're trying to teach in, in science into content and skills, for instance. Now, let me give an example. Are you trying to teach experimental design, how to design an experiment, or are you trying to teach how to conduct an experiment? Now, the two are very different. You can teach experimental design through simulations. You can create a simulated experiment. You can give students simulated equipment and ask them to put that together in order to do an experiment, for instance. Um, they can't actually do the experiment, but you can assess how well they, they've done the design of that experiment. But if they have to conduct the experiment, then they probably have to have actual equipment, unless you can simulate it. Now, we are seeing simulations coming in where um, you're given some sort of chemicals, you're given quantities of chemicals and you have to decide how much of each and which chemicals to mix. And you can do, you can simulate the outcomes of that and you can make it fun. You can have explosions if they get it wrong, things like that, which you couldn't do in class, but they cost money to do. And um, what we're seeing is individual professors trying to do simulations. But what you need is more like a multimedia games team to do this. You need really good uh, uh, visual designers, uh, uh, web designers. You need very good scientists to do this. You need uh, a whole team. And that means putting money into this. And that's what's been lacking at the moment. Nobody's wanted to put money into this. Uh, we're talking at the moment in Canada, the colleges are talking to the federal government about putting $20 million into building simulations for teaching apprentices. Um, so if you're um, uh, a plumber, or, or let's take welding, if you're a welder, uh, could we build a really good simulation to train welders, simulations to train welders? We know that a lot of welding is now done anyway, electronically. So for instance, in pipelines, they run a robot down the pipeline and that checks for cracks. And there's a welder operating the robot, for instance. So we're seeing how the technology itself is changing the, the nature. But we need good training modules because basically welding is welding. It doesn't matter which college teaches it. So if we had good simulations for that, we could do much more practical work. But yes, it is very difficult to do this. We are seeing some virtual labs being set up now. That means that students can operate equipment virtually. So there's a physical lab set up, it's linked through the web. Students go in, they book a time, to book a time on the equipment. They have a set of experiments sent to them by email or by through the learning management system. And then they go in and log in and can actually operate the equipment. So for instance, they can have a very powerful electron microscope. There'll be a set of slides in the lab they can, sorry, they, they can um, operate the equipment from home and see the results of the experiment. But again, th th these are exceptions. And what we don't have is enough things that can be used generally throughout science teaching, but it's coming. Thank you so much for that. And moving on to the next question, this is about assessments. Uh, from Dr. Set Answer uh, is asking, should the digital competency be taught as a course on its own or be a blended of the various course contents? When you mentioned uh, the case of assessment should be via portfolio and uh, what uh, 
an experience the students have gathered over the years through the hair portfolio. So the person is asking that should we now teach digital competency as a course or it should be integrated into uh, various other course contents? I'm sorry, I'm looking for the question and can't find it. <laughs> okay. All right, I think uh, the question from set answer. Well, I think, yes, you said assessment should be an equal. Well, I, I didn't say it should be, I said it can be. I, can I don't be, want okay. to tell anybody what they should do, I, I would say what you could do. Um, but um, I, I, I think that. You can use an e-portfolio in both fully online teaching and in the blended learning. You could even use it in a face-to-face -face class, for instance. You could ask the students to do work online, for instance, and put it in their e-portfolio. Um, e-portfolios can be used in different ways. One is for assessment. One is just to help a student uh, reflect on what they're doing, for instance. It, it's like, it's, a, it's another way of note taking basically, but it's a richer way of note taking for their own benefit. So sometimes you can have an e-portfolio that's private just for the students. Um, and then they can decide which part of that or create a separate one that's for the instructor to see. And then when the instructor evaluates it, they can go back and create one that they can take to an employer, for instance. So there are three ways you can use uh, an e-portfolio. You can use it for personal benefit. You can use it for uh, feedback and assessment by the instructor, or you can use it as a way of saying, look, this is what I did when I was a student. Uh, instead of just giving a grade, which is much more helpful to a student, to an employer to see what somebody's actually done online. Um, again, the, the one they take to the employer has to be kind of, security based and, and date stamped by the institution that is authentic and so on. And that's coming now with blockchain. You can do that with blockchain, for instance, but that's more advanced. I think from an instructor's point of view, um, an e-portfolio can be very formal. You can have a structure and you can say, well, here's assignment one, here's assignment two, put the stuff in there, um, or it can be informal. So again, it depends on the design of the course. So they're very flexible e-portfolios. Um, but I find them extremely useful. Um, it, 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 you know, this stuff that students do privately that they don't want you to know about. They may be talking to other students, they making mistakes, or they may be cheating for all you know, but then there's things they do that they want you to see. And uh, I like to make it very clear that what I want to see is when they're ready to share something, put it in the e-portfolio and they can go back and change it on the basis of my feedback if you want to. Um, and I, I don't think it matters whether it's face-to-face -face or online. There's the, the e-portfolio can stay, can, can be used in, in both contexts. Okay. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, there are some questions coming from uh, YouTube participants. I'm taking the first one from uh, Dr. Oluni Oluwakemi. Uh, she's asking, how do we balance content and skills in design in designing lesson? So how do we balance content and skills? I think you mentioned both in the course of your presentation. Sorry, how do we balance? Skills and contents. Skills and contents, how do we balance yes. it? That's a good question. Yes. I would start with the skills and work back to what con what's the minimum content they need in order to de develop this skill. What we usually start with content and hope that they will develop the skills around the content. But if we start with the skill, let, let's say um, I'm teaching uh, critical thinking, then what level of critical thinking can I expect them to come in with uh, when they start the course and what level of critical thinking? How will they demonstrate that critical thinking at the end of the course? Then what content will they need to work through in order to show 
that level of critical thinking. We, we don't do critical thinking teaching very well. Uh, we, we t in universities, we tend to model it. So we, our lectures are an example of critical thinking. We'll say on the one hand this, but I think <laughs> on the other hand, Professor X says this, and Professor Y says that, and at the end of the day, here's my conclusions. We do the critical thinking and hopefully they mirror that. I think we need to be more explicit. I think we need to say, this is what's in get involved in critical thinking. You have to look at alternatives. You have to come up with different ways of interpreting the, this data or the, these, these phenomena, phenomena or whatever you're studying. Then you go back and say, well, what are good, good, what are good examples that they can draw on for that critical thinking? Um, rather than try to teach, now that it depends on the subject matter. Some subject matters are what I call progressive, you know, that, like mathematics. If you haven't done um, arithmetic, you can't do calculus, you know, so you have to have content built in steps there. But, but again, uh, arithmetic is a skill, it's not a content, it's, it's a way of handling numbers. The numbers are the content. So you only use the numbers you need to teach arithmetic. You don't have to teach all the numbers. Um, so again, it, it, it's looking at the skill and then going back to what content do they need in order to develop that right, skill. skill. All right. Thank you so much, sir. And um, I have a question here, like uh, from Aliyu Rabiu, Aliyu Alaji Rabiu is asking, Please, how could we transfer the student's teacher physio emotional attachment in face to face learning to the online based learning? Well, I think there are a variety of ways. Um, I always ask students at the beginning of a course to post a short bio, um, a little description of who they are, why they're studying the course, uh, you know, what they're interests are, if they like playing football or whatever. Um, I asked them if they wanted to share that with the rest of the class. Some students are hesitant to do that, especially uh, female students for good reasons. But I asked them to say, you can have it private just so I can know who you are or public so everybody knows who you are. So that's one way of uh, getting, getting students to relate to other students and also to relate to, to me as a professor. Um, I use online discussion forums quite a lot tied to content in the course. I don't make, I don't make these um, optional because I say, I, I put questions in that students need to answer. Uh, they can answer them as a group or collectively or individually, but they, they have to go in and discuss the question and it won't be the same as an end of course question, but they can see very clearly that by participating in this, uh, then they can link with other students and work with other students. I'm very careful about not asking students to grade each other in collaborative learning. I don't think that works very well. Um, what I will say is I can see your online discussion. So I can see who's contributing and who isn't. And I might give a mark for that. Um, so I think there are various ways you can bring that teacher student uh, uh, connection. Uh, I, I will send a private email to a student saying you haven't participated in the this week. Is there a problem at home? Um, can I help? You know, is there anything I can do? Is there things you can't you're not understanding? So I, I tend to be more uh, what's the word outreaching more positive in approaching students than passive, waiting for them to reach me, more active. Uh, I, I, so there are lots of little things you can do. I, I usually have what I call a student cafe. This is where students go and talk about anything. It doesn't have to be about the course. Um, I was teaching once during the World Cup soccer. And so I, I had a student cafe and we had student, I had students from actually different countries. So very interesting uh, social discussions in the, in, in the student cafe. This was quite outside the course, but um, 
there's all the students in the course were in the same student cafe and I participated in that as well to get that kind of social connection with students so but I, you, you have to work at it. it it doesn't happen naturally you just sit back it won't happen Great. Uh, the idea of student cafe is a very sounds very interesting to me sir <laughs> so where students are able to dialogue even outside the course they are they are very much uh you know they, they have the freedom to express their mind and that can definitely build a good bond among the students and also with the professor thank you so much on that side i think let's just take this one last uh, question um someone is asking what are the practical ways of reducing or curbing my practices during assessments conducted online. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, we're talking here about continuous assessment rather than summative assessment. Um, I like continuous assessment online because for two reasons. Uh, one, it saves me an awful lot of work at the end of the course. <laughs> you know, when I have to mark. 40 or 50 assignments. Um, and secondly, I, I, I can use it, I call it formative assessment. In other words, uh, if a student does an, a, a small assignment uh, I, at the end of the first week, uh, I, I can see if that student has certain problems like writing problems. And I, I can say, look, you've got a problem here. You're, your, your grammar isn't very good, etc. cetera. Um, now I might say, don't worry about that. I'm not here to teach you English, but I'm here to assess you. And so feel free not to worry too much about getting the English perfect, but what I really want you to show is that you've understood what, what that unit was about, okay? Other students, I might say, look, if, if they're getting towards say the end of their degree course, I might say, you're going to have to resubmit this assignment now uh, in better English. Um, get somebody to help you because I'm not accepting this at this level of English. So it depends on, you know, depends. But by doing that in the first week, then I can pick up problems early rather than the students struggling all the way through. So I like to have what I call small assignments that students can do relatively easily that I can give a very quick grade on. And then I can basically assess a student, not so much on uh, the end point, but how they progress through the course. So if I have a student who comes in who's very weak at the beginning, but has done very well through the course, but not as well as some of the other students, I might take that into account at the end. Um, so this is very subjective and it wouldn't be acceptable in some subject areas I know in math and science you'd actually have to have them reach a certain standard but in other subject areas I think you, you can have a bit of flexibility. My objective is to enable every student to succeed so I, I don't want to lower standards to do that but I want to help the students get to that standard if I can. Um, so continuous assessment gives me more opportunity to do that than waiting for an assessment or even a half term assessment. It's often too late by half term. Um, by the time they get there, they've either dropped out or um, they're just beyond recovery. You know, they're just so far behind, they can't catch up. So, and I like the tracking that I, I never got when I was teaching face to face. I would give a lecture, go to class, I, I might set assignment at, at, at half term, but that, that's all I, I would know about any student in my class is what they did in the half term exam. I, I, I might get four or five asking questions each week, so I know those students, but the rest would be, were a blank to me. Whereas with online, I, I can see how students are progressing individually as they go through the course. Thank you so much, sir, for that response. Uh, I think uh, right now we have to draw the cutting of this month's edition. We've had uh, Professor Tony Bates 
uh, from Canada. We've had him on the presentation seat for about an hour ago. So uh, we need to release him and hoping to contact you some other time, sir. Uh, somebody wanted to see a screen, so I'll, I'll put that up uh, on the slide. Okay. Before I go. Uh, yes. In the meantime, sir, uh, the president of the association would like to give us uh, some final words before we run it up for today. Professor Isu. Okay, thanks so much. First and foremost, I would like to thank and appreciate Professor Tony Bates. He has been a mentor to all of us. For several years, we have been uh, his students, albeit not physically, through his uh, enormous work, which we have found very useful for us as uh, faculty here and also as uh, those who are trying to emulate is this in terms of uh, online learning. We want to appreciate you. We know there is nothing that we can uh, give to you that will equate what you are giving to us as time in terms of your time and the invaluable uh, resources you have given to us in terms of ideas today. And I'm sure every one of us, if you look at the comments and what we have on the, on the YouTube, people have been talking about it. We are so happy. We can never ever thank you enough. Thanks so much, Prof. We hope if we call you again, you will oblige us and then you support us. Thanks so much again. We really appreciate you. For the participants, we also appreciate you for being with us. We have people online, uh, both here on the Zoom. We also have them also on the YouTube. We want to thank everyone. So until next time when we'll be having uh, the next lecture, we appreciate you, Prof and all the participants. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure doing it. I hope it was relevant for you. You know, it's... it was very good, sir. <laughs> it's very excellent, sir. Yes, sir. Why is so you can edit the program now? All right. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Tony Bates. Thank you for honoring our invitation. We are so very grateful for that. So, participant, uh, thank you so much. This is where we draw the curtain for this month. Uh, we hope to meet again on another interesting topic and uh, another interesting facilitator as I'm very sure we have all enjoyed Professor Tony Bates today. Thank you so much. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Okay, bye sir. Bye-bye.